All right, welcome back, everybody. This is our last lecture of the semester, and it's one that addresses not necessarily something that's critical for this particular final assignment. Uh, in fact, we're, we're kind of done with everything with respect to the final assignment. It's just fine tuning and tweaking a few things for the vast majority of you. What we're going to be doing in this lecture is covering something that I'm guessing is very important to a lot of you and something you're probably thinking about on your horizon, something that you know, is not necessarily critical for everybody to, to be going through. That's why for this particular video, since there's no quiz on it, no test on it, I, I just want to mention that if our discussion about careers in psychology and in particular graduate school does not pertain to you, you just have no interest in going down that path, um, by all means, feel free not to watch this video, not to go over the content that we're going to be discussing in this presentation. But if you are thinking about moving on, going into a master's program, a, a post-baccalaureate program, or even some sort of a PhD slash PsyD program that looks at things relating to psychology, I really want to dedicate at least one lecture to this specific topic, because as you're finishing up this class, you are hitting the home stretch in your undergraduate career, and that means that you are going to probably not only be turning your attention to final projects and senior theses, but probably the application process that goes along with a lot of programs that you might want to get into after you're done at Cal State East Bay. Uh, because even though technically in psychology, you can find lots of careers that somewhat relate to psychology by just getting your undergraduate degree, as you probably heard by many professors along the way, most people looking to pursue careers in psychology need more than just their bachelor's degree. And usually a master's degree is an absolute minimum to get into programs where you might practice or might utilize some of the tools that we've helped you develop um, and, and you will continue to develop in those master's programs. Even a lot of people will find that master's programs are sort of lacking in getting them the prerequisite skills to move on in the careers that they're envisioning. So what I wanna do in this class is just cover what's expected as you're starting to pursue those master's or, or PhD or PsyD programs that I know a lot of you are thinking about getting into because a lot of the things that are required as you're applying for those programs, things you actually have to turn your attention to now. It's a little too late when you get to the application process to do a lot of the things that these programs are looking for you to have done. So to, to kind of go over some of the things that are expected and some of the paths that you can choose, I figured I'd just go to Cal State East Bay's graduate programs in psychology, which you'll see here listed on our website in psychology, is that most of the programs that we offer at Cal State East Bay are MS programs or Master of Science programs. These are usually two-year programs that sometimes have an internship tied to it, where a lot of other ones are two years programs with classes, and then you have a subsequent year of doing an internship, or practicing in whatever profession you get into. So then after getting that certification, along with your education, you can get into a whole bunch of different types of things like a counseling, education specialties, um, and some other more kind of day-to-day -day specific programs that are out there. Now, if you're trying to get into these specific graduate programs here at Cal State East Bay, a lot of you are probably doing the things that we're expecting you to have done to get into these programs. Need an, an impeccable GPA, you know, 3.0 is kind of considered an absolute minimum for most graduate programs. Um, but in addition to needing that impeccable GPA, you also need a lot of experience. You, you want to have a background in some sort of volunteering program that relates to what it is you're interested in. Uh, that sometimes can be stuff that you do at a school or through some sort of an outreach program that's available in your local community. And then also, in addition to those things, we need some sort of research experience. The senior theses are often one of the things that are required of applicants to the graduate programs. 
not the ones we're working on here. Um, because again, we're, we're working with made up data, but when you're applying to a lot of the programs, including the ones you see here, what they're going to ask for RAM scripts, an explanation of your work exposure relating to the area, several letters of recommendation, usually two to three letters of recommendation are required at most schools. Some have even upped that to four or even five letters of recommendation that they want for people applying to their programs. And then some examples of writing. Now, if you've been in a lab for a substantial amount of time, you might even had a couple publications under your belt. There's going to be lots of people applying to these programs that do have two, three, four different papers that they've been a co-author on, whether or not they're the ones that are the primary authors or somebody that's just kind of listed in the authorship because they contributed to a paper. You know, those things are going to be components of lots of people's resumes as they apply to these programs. If you're in those programs, great, right? If you're doing those things already, that's exactly what's expected. If you're not, the big thing that you're going to have that you will be using for your applications are these senior projects that you're going to be working on. And that means that you really want to make sure that not only is your writing impeccable within these papers, but your work is sound. That's why we've been harping on in this class the needs to not only be able to analyze your data, but to be able to understand that data, to be able to find resources and not only talk about them briefly, but be able to integrate them with the ideas that you have. And a lot of this stuff might feel tedious when you get started on these things, but this is the kind of stuff that in every graduate program you're going to be expected to do, not just once or twice, but multiple times as you're progressing through these programs. You know, here, you're not just studying a couple classes and, and reading a couple things from books and taking tests. Here, you're putting what's out there into action and you're trying to add to conversations within the literature and, and within the community by being able to synthesize what's going on, think up ideas and, and be able to present it in a way that, that somebody can actually process and, and utilize for their own work or, or the, you know, the, their own interests. There's a lot that has to be done for this to be able to be accomplished. And, and that's why when even master's programs are asking for applications, they're looking for a lot of stuff. Now, if you're going to a higher level of education, if you're pursuing a PsyD or a PhD, I don't know what the differences are. PsyDs tend to be ones that are more focused on practice. The PhDs are ones that are more focused on research. Both are five years to seven years, depending upon the program that you're getting into. Both require lots of classwork. Both require lots of activities that we are either practicums or running labs or doing things depending upon the type of program you're looking at. And both usually require an extra year of training after you're done, either with a postdoctorate program or some sort of an internship um, where you, you're kind of working on the profession that you're getting into. You know, with all of those things required, this type of stuff is, is not only asked when you're coming up with applications. Usually they want to see that, that you've already done a lot of footwork. Um, and this can mean lots of things, right? It could mean that you, you've done stuff as an undergrad and you're ready to go. Or it could mean that you're taking the let a lot of people take these days. And that's getting into labs, working with people, and kind of staying in those things for a year, two, three years after you've graduated. So you can build that resume that actually qualifies you for a lot of those different graduate programs. Now, to talk about graduate programs is this one size fits all entity, it's probably an inaccurate description. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of different graduate programs in the United States that offer PhDs in psychology. And, and there's even hundreds more of PsyD programs and other types of specialist training programs that, that, that can focus in on psychological concepts that don't necessarily fit the mold of the traditional you know, four-year with a PhD program system that, that, that's out there. The rigor within those programs varies dramatically in terms of how much research you're going to do, how much 
practice you're going to do, what types of paths you're going to take, and, and kind of what's expected of you when you get in there. But for, for all of these programs, whether they're ones that you're paying 20, 30,000 year, dollars a year to attend or ones that are covered through grants and loans and other stuff, um, whichever type you're looking at, you know, the, the, the rigor of them, the intensity of them is, is pretty high. Um, and, and they want to make sure that if you're going to get into those programs, since completion rates are really critical to them, that you do have all the prerequisites behind you, you know, that you've taken care of all the things that they need to see you be able to do so they can ensure that you at least got a good chance of being successful in these graduate programs that you're looking into. So when we talk about things you can do to prepare for these graduate programs, or other stuff that, that, that you might be interested in looking in, you know, talking about being able to do research, being able to analyze data, um, having a, a consistently high GPA, having good letters of recommendation. They're not just things that in, ensure you're going to get into graduate programs, but things that give you a chance of getting into these extremely competitive programs that are, are available throughout the United States and a whole bunch of other countries as well. Hopefully at this point in time, you've already thought of a couple letter writers that you might be using for your applications in these programs. Hopefully in addition to that, you've already thought of a couple writings that you might wanna to submit to these programs and a couple things that you might want to look into as you're applying to these programs. Because a lot of them not only require just general assessment of, of your abilities, but they want to know what you would do in these programs. If you're applying to a clinical program, what are your dreams? What are your plans with getting into the program and, and getting out? If you're trying to apply to a research-based school, what kind of research do you want to do? Whose lab do you want to be in? What type of ideas do you have? Again, when, when you're transitioning to graduate school, Lots of people find, which is kind of surprising, is that the classes are just this secondary thing that's a part of your graduate training. The main thrust of your work that you do in a lot of these graduate programs is the research, is the, the practicing of whatever profession you're getting into from a very rudimentary level up to an extremely advanced level by the time you get done with those things. So to just say I had a decent GPA, I took some fun classes and I want to continue is not what graduate programs are looking for um, in, in applicants that are trying to get into those programs. So what, what I want you to be thinking about as we're talking about this and, and going through this is what plan you have in mind, what, what type of program you want to get into. And what tools you might need at your disposal when you get into those programs. And sometimes you can do this just by thinking about it. Other times, one of the things you can do is look into specific graduate programs that are out there. You know, maybe you're somebody that's California. You only are capable of attending graduate programs if they're here in California. Others <laughs> might be very... All right. Uh, very committed to a specific specialty. Maybe you are obsessed with neuroscience, behavioral neuroscience, and you want to get into a lab at a top tier research institute that's doing that. Maybe you have a general idea of a profession that you want to get into, but you, you know you don't necessarily even know where you want to go. Regardless of what category you fit in, the best ways to figure out what's out there is to just do some searches on those things. I mean, you'll see when you look at different programs, not only general information about what they're like and what they offer, but general information about who gets in and, and what the chances of getting into these graduate programs are. Let's say, um, you want to, look at the best clinical psychology programs out there. So you do a search of PhD programs on the U.S. News and World Report, and you find there's a number of different programs that are available around the country that specialize in clinical psychology. 
UCLA is a top one. University of North Carolina Chapel Hills one. My alma mater, UC Berkeley's number three, tied with Stony Brook. That's the first time I've seen them out of the top three. Um, we also got the University of Minnesota really high up there. Major state universities, which is very common, that have a multitude of different programs within them. Programs like Berkeley and UNC Chapel Hill and Stony Brook, actually, all of these having not just clinical psychology programs, but a whole variety of different PhD programs in psychology available. If we look at the programs and their listing, what you'll often see when looking at them is not only kind of general information about where they're ranked and what their websites are like, but if you click further into this US World News Report, what you'll also find usually are things like acceptance rates and what the requirements are and what GRE or other type of scores you might need to apply to these specific programs. And what you'll find once you start digging through these things is a wide array of different requirements for each program and a wide array of rigor that, that, that's kind of asked of you when you apply to these programs. UCLA, UC Berkeley, UNC Chapel Hill are all extremely competitive programs with usually for a lot of them around 1% of the applicants applying to these schools getting into their graduate programs. Did not mistake that it's around 1% of, of applicants that get into a lot of these PhD programs. And mind you, these aren't just random applicants. These are highly competitive applicants coming from across the world trying to get into these programs. I, I know when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, our clinical program had over 500 applicants that, that tried to get into the program at that time. And we accepted in our year five students, exactly 1% of the applicants got into our PhD clinical program at the time. And if you looked at the resumes of those individuals, they were insanely good. And the arms race has only gotten worse over the years. I'm not telling you this to, to kind of dissuade you from applying to these graduate programs. But what I am telling you, when you look at these graduate programs, I, if you're wondering, I was not part of the clinical program. I, I did social personality where there were fewer applicants, more acceptances. So I'm not trying to, to, to kind of to my own horn at this moment. But but anyway, when you look at these programs and start breaking them down, what you, I want you to understand is you really got to start doing you, you, your footwork now, right? You, you got to start studying for those GREs. You got to start building that resume through not only these research papers that you were writing, but through getting into labs and doing volunteer work and ensuring that not only do you have a good GPA, but you've taken some tough classes. I mean, if you're taking a bunch of I don't know, basic kinesthetic theory and music theory and other types of kind of post back programs, we're just showing up, or sorry, undergraduate programs, we're just showing up is enough to get you an A. Schools will sniff that out. Um, they will be kind of aware of, of what you did and what path you took, and that could prevent them um, from being willing to take you in on these programs, at least off the bat. And you might have to do a year or two of post back and it might have to build a resume through other experiences to kind of optimize your chances of getting into these programs. All this, you know, is, is, does require a lot of work. And I'm hoping through this presentation that we just had here, you know, you're sort of aware of these ideas. You're sort of now attuned to the fact that this is a next step in the process in your careers and in your futures that you want to start thinking about, you want to start planning. Because unfortunately, you know, when it comes to academia, it's not a nice, easy, obvious progression sometimes. There's choices that you have to make, paths that you have to, to kind of figure out, and things that we don't always tell you about that you should be doing that becomes critical for a lot of those opportunities that, that I'm hoping a lot of you might pursue in the future. In terms of the general gist of graduate school and graduate programs, I guess the big message I want to get across is 
and you get started in, in looking at what's out there, figuring out what you need and, and building that resume. So when it comes to the applications that you might be working on again, at the same time you're working on these senior papers, uh, you, you're ready for them. And you, you're gonna be capable of really thriving in a very competitive field uh, that, that's wonderful if you can get into it. Uh, but you, you got to make sure that you're doing what you need to do to, to have a chance of being successful in that. It's going to be it for today, um, which means it's also going to be it for this class. It doesn't mean I'm disappearing forever. I've still got a little while to go. Um, so if you have any questions along the way, either about this stuff or your papers or anything else, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to help you with anything I can. And I want to make sure that everybody's feeling good about themselves and their, their papers and their paths forward. So I, I am readily available to anybody that needs me over the next couple of weeks. But for now, I'm going to bid you adieu. Hope that you're doing well and, and hope that I will hopefully see great papers and, and see you all down the road in the future. All right, take care, everybody.